the Flatlanders. Joe Ely, Jimmy Dale, Gilmore, Butch Hancock. That was so cool. We went up to New York to do the Letterman show. I was backstage a lot with Biff Henderson. I don't know if you remember Biff Henderson, the, the stage manager. What a nice guy. We're in the green room with the girl who always played Letterman's wife in the audience, you know, that would be mad at him, <laughs> and who actually I think is married to Howard Stern now. Just So we were in there visiting with her, and um, Joe and Jimmy and Butch went out and they were practicing with Paul. Walking down the sidewalk, Elvis Costello com comes down, and he asks who's on. He finds out it's Joe and Jimmy and Butch. Well, he's a fan of Joe's, so he comes in, and I remember I was so amazed that I was getting to meet Elvis Costello. I had no idea that that was Diana Krall with him. You know, I was just... <laughs> <laughs> and he was, you know, that was really cool, though. That was the same night Tom Cruise was there. And I've never experienced that. You know, we don't have paparazzi in Nashville, or didn't back then. I don't know if we do now or not. But when Tom Cruise pulled up, I was outside just kind of looking around. Tom Cruise pulls up in this black SUV. And it was masterful because on one side, all the paparazzi were over here and fans were over here. And he gets out, and they shielded him from the paparazzi when he went over and shook hands with all of, the, all of his fans. And I came around behind him and went inside, and I was there with Biff. And I guess because I've seen him in movies, you feel like you know the guy. He comes in, he stands to about right there on me. And he's like, hey, nice to see you. And it's like... Like seeing an old friend, you know. Great to see you, Tom. You okay? Yeah, everything's great. He goes into the green room. Seconds later, the manager comes out. We've got to clear this hall. And I know Tom went in there and said, get those people. <laughs> <laughs> I know he did. But he was nice for the moment. But the Flatlanders were great. And I remember standing in the hallway. I had walked down the hall with Paul Schaefer. And I, I knew his wife, Kathy um, because she used to be a publicist as well. And I knew her from dealing with that. And I walked with Paul. And, of course, he was busy. He had no time to talk to me. And he, but he was okay. He was friendly. But then I'm in the hall with Joe and Jimmy and Butch. And Letterman comes through. And all he did was wave at them and jumped up the stairs three <laughs> steps at a time. It looked like that, that um, grasshopper in James and the Giant Peach. <laughs> You know, jumping up the stairs. But it was great. It was really wonderful. I remember that the booker came to me during the rehearsal, and she was not happy. And she said, this is not the song I bought. And I'm like, well, what, you know. Bought? What? Yeah, you know, when she, when she booked them. And um, so I go and I talk to Joe and Jimmy and Butch, and they said, well, Paul's the one that did this. So later, she came and she apologized and said, yeah, Paul said he did that. So it wasn't our choice. It was Paul. So he kind of, you know. So Paul liked that song and was hoping they'd play Well, I, I think it was maybe the arrangement that she didn't like. But I'll tell you, that, that Letterman, um, I think that may have been the only time I ever went to Letterman show. Were the guys in the band fans of Letterman going into it, like Butch and oh, Joe? Yeah. Yeah, well, they, they certainly loved his, um, what he had done for at that time. You know, he was such a huge champion of that. It didn't seem like with Letterman that he was as driven by ratings as they are now. You know, if he liked somebody. I worked with Michael Martin Murphy, and Letterman started saying, making jokes to Paul about sod busting. So... Murph's booking agent, that was right before I started working with Murph, his booking agent called and said, do you know who books Letterman? And so I gave him the name. Well, they booked Murph. And it was such a big deal. Murph was really, in, on, the, on that scale, was not a big deal anymore, you know. And Letterman um, had him on. He played not only Wildfire, but after the taping ended, Letterman had him play Carolina for the audience, too, which, you know, you can get now on Letterman's um, channel on YouTube, the, the both performances. You know, he was such a champion. I worked with Tom Russell, and Letterman was a huge fan of Tom. 
And one year, he had his office called me and wanted to book Tom to come up to play. I guess he has a ranch in, is it Montana, maybe? Mm-hmm. Wanted Tom to come up and play the 4th of July celebration up there. And everybody I've ever talked to that talks to, has dealt with Letterman, tells me that he is, you know, kind of aloof when it comes to dealing with musicians. Uh, you know, when I was in college, he came to, he was, it was right before his first, um, his first show started. He came to college and one of my friends drove from Murray State, Kentucky to the airport to pick him up. And they told me he sat in the back of the car, never said a word to him. And, and I went to that show and it was brilliant. It was so funny. But they said that he was just not particularly forthcoming or friendly at all. It's just, and I don't mean friendly. My, my nephew sells sports memorabilia. So he goes to all those, those um, sporting events, you know. So he's met a lot of the celebrities. He's got this. I try, and, I try and apply this these days. He's got this um, three strikes rule when he meets a celebrity athlete. You've got uh, three strikes to prove whether you're a jerk or not. Because he figures, you know, somebody may have a bad day. Maybe he's struggling with something else. But if that happens three times, they're a jerk. <laughs> 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 and I think that's probably accurate. Or at least, it, you know, you don't wanna, sometimes you don't want to meet your heroes. I like keeping some people on a pedestal. You know, they had they had just worked with Robert Redford on The Horse Whisperer. I mean, he had asked them to put together a song for The Horse Whisperer. So, you know, the thing I love about Joe and Jimmy and Butch is they seem so unaffected by celebrity and success. We were talking about Butch Hancock earlier. It's just not what drives them. And, um, you know, I talked to Joe once, and I said, what'd you do this weekend? And Joe said, well, Julia Roberts had sent a plane for him to come down to her birthday party. And I said, Joe, why didn't you tell me that? And he said, well, Lance, you're my publicist. That's why I didn't tell you that. <laughs> you know, and I, and I love that because, you know, Joe, he, you know, celebrity means nothing to him. You know, he's got a lot of celebrity friends. You know, big deal. It's, you know, they're, that's just what they do for a living. And he respects them. He loves them. But he's not, he's not a name dropper. So I don't get the chance to praise Butch Hancock as much as I, yeah. I should. He's one of my absolute favorite songwriters. Yeah. I don't think there's anybody better. No, there's not. Him. There's no better songs. No better there. person than Butch Hancock. You know, you start there with, a, and you know, all, all of those guys, everybody, uh, Joe Ely, Jimmy Dale Gilmore, Butch Hancock, Terry Allen, there's no better people on the planet than those guys. I, you know, I've worked with, I've been with that crowd, well, I've been with Joe since 1988, off and on. And I, honest to God, can't think of one negative thing to say about him. I can't think of one negative thing to say about Jimmy. I can't think of one negative, and I I can think of some other artists I've worked with. I can, but, you know, Butch, what amazes me about Butch is here's this guy who's arguably one of the, certainly in the top 10 songwriters in Texas, alive. And what does he do? He loads up his guitar and gets in a raft and goes down the Brazos, you know, the Rio Grande and leads, you know, camping expeditions. You know, just so unmoved by all the celebrity of the music business. Just not interested in it. I once drove uh, from Indianapolis to Austin to go to Lubbock or Leave It, which was... uh, his store that he opened, like mm-hmm. a music store. Mm-hmm. I drove all the way down there just to see it, and uh, me and my best friend Todd, and um, he wasn't there, but there was a woman that was running it. It was beautiful. Slade Cleaves worked there around that time, oh, and no we, we didn't see him. <laughs> and uh, so I went to that trouble, but then I stood next to him in a parking lot of a hotel um, in Okemo, Oklahoma, uh-huh. and um, didn't bother him by saying hi or anything. 
And uh, it's weird how you drive all the way to Austin, but you won't <laughs> turn three feet and say, <laughs> you know. You know, that's, that's um, he would have been happy to talk to you. Yeah. He'd probably talk your ear off. He's, uh, I, I can go six months and not talk to Butch, and when I talk to him, it's like I just talked to him yesterday. You know, he's just one of those kind of open kind of guys. Um, and again, there's never any I'm better than you, that kind of. There's never that with any of those guys. Yeah. You know, I, I signed, um, after I left Vector Management, I signed Sam Bush to represent him, which I'd already worked with him at Newgrass Survival. And it occurred to me that the people I really love working with the most, and Joe and Jimmy and Butch and Terry all fit into that, are the people who, if they'd never made a dime, would still be doing the exact same thing they're doing. You know, they just happen to be, fame and celebrity is not what drives them. It's the, it's the art. It's just who they are. They can't help it. You know, that's who I'll, you know, people who are interested in art, and, you know, certainly those guys are, um, they take a little bit of a, I don't know if it's fair to say, they have a little bit of a um, zen kind of way of doing business, you know. Uh, I used to think, you know, Jimmy, I, I'll talk to him and say, when are you going to make a record? No, I don't know. When, you know, when I get around to it, <laughs> you know, when it presents itself, that's how those guys are, and I love that about them. There's no, um, no pretension whatsoever. Well, I think that's where that comes from with Elvis Costello. I think that, you know, I think he probably knew Joe through The Clash, that's my guess. I, of course, I didn't ask Elvis that. I was too hubba da hubba da hubba da, it's Elvis Costello. You know, when I met him. So, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I've asked Joe about about the clash before, and it's yeah. I love Joe. You know, he he wanted to do a project with Joe Strummer, and Joe Do Joe Strummer passed away. So, that would have been pretty remarkable if it had happened. Definitely. But I I really appreciate the generosity that these guys show to one another. And it's all, res it's all respect. It's not because they could help each other. It's just sheer respect for the art. 